Hey guys, this is Dr. Lisa Schieber, and in this presentation we're going to look at HIV and AIDS. I'm going to start off talking about the HIV virus and what exactly that is and what it does. So HIV causes an insidious destruction of the immune system. So essentially it causes chaos of the immune system or the immune response. HIV targets your T cells or it beats up your T cells and if your T cells are not working appropriately or they've been destroyed it's hard to initiate that immune response. Over time the immune system weakens and when your immune system can no longer protect you that's when we classify someone as having AIDS. Now the course is going to vary um, how long will somebody have HIV before they are diagnosed with having AIDS? It varies. Um, sometimes they don't ever convert over to having or where we diagnose them as having AIDS because their immune system has been relatively healthy. Um, but then sometimes it seems like the course is very quick. So it depends on a lot of other factors, the patient's overall health, things like that as well. Why is HIV so hard to treat? Why do we not have a cure? Well, it's because the virus has mutated and continued to mutate. It is true that the virus um, did come from monkeys or was once the SIV virus, the simian immunodeficiency virus, which is a virus only monkeys can get, but that virus mutated and now it is a virus that can affect humans. There are two different types of HIV. You've got HIV-1 and HIV-2. From those types they can be further divided into groups and then further divided and further divided. So you may have somebody who has HIV-1 group M type B or you might have somebody with HIV-1 group O type J. And that's another reason it's very hard to come up with a cure for HIV is because of the mutation of that virus that continues to occur. Some AIDS facts. HIV kills more people than any other infectious disease. Previously HIV was seen or considered a death sentence if you will and now it's viewed more as a chronic disease. We honestly don't know how long somebody can live with HIV because if you think about the history, HIV was first um, named or discovered, if you will. We had a name for it. It was identified in the 80s. So we really don't know, you know, long term how long patients can live with it. There are patients that were diagnosed in the 80s that are still alive today and doing well. So there's a lot of unknowns still with this uh, virus. With medicine, uh, we are seeing patients who are staying healthier longer. The expected lifespan of somebody with HIV is actually increased now too with the medical treatment that's available. In the U.S., there are 55,000 new infections per year. And the scary number is 250,000 folks have it in the U.S. and don't know. So they potentially could be spreading HIV to others because they don't know they're infected. They may feel fine. Another scary fact is 50% of all infections in the U.S. are centered there in the south, as you can see on this map. And this map is a couple years old but I don't think the colors have changed very much. And if you look in the southern areas there, the darker the state, the higher the percentage of patients with HIV. So 50% of all HIV cases are gonna be in the southern states. Risk factors for HIV. Big thing you've gotta keep in mind, it doesn't matter what your preferences are it's what you're doing to protect yourself that is so important so it doesn't matter if you are a girl who likes girls or a boy who likes boys or 
girls who like boys, whatever the combination, that doesn't matter. It's what do you do to protect yourself that matters. There are some behaviors that put people more at risk, such as multiple sex partners or having unprotected sex. And the argument has been made time and time again, well, condoms aren't always effective. Well, they are 99% effective if the right size is purchased and it's also put on at the correct time. So condoms are indeed effective if they're used correctly. Other factors that put people at risk are exposure to others' body fluids. And these have to be body fluids that contain blood. Um, it could be semen, pre-semen contains the HIV virus, breast milk contains the HIV virus. So traditionally we think of blood, but it also could be other body fluids or any body fluids containing blood. So again, what are you doing to protect yourself. That's the most important part. Other risk factors include exposure to blood. Are you a transplant patient or did you get a transfusion? We just started screening blood in 85. That's when we knew about HIV. We knew it was transmitted through blood and that's when the blood screening started to occur. When we're talking to a patient about receiving blood, we do have to let them know as part of the informed consent that there is still a risk factor, but we do also tell them that all blood is screened for things like hepatitis and HIV and things of that nature, West Nile. But there still is a very teeny tiny minute chance that they could contract HIV, although blood is all screened. Other risk factors, uh, patients who inject drugs or share needles, reuse needles. We see a good many folks in our area here that use um, IV street drugs or share needles and that puts a lot of folks at risk as well. Occupational exposure, we are at risk as nurses, but the percentages are really, really low. If you got stuck with a needle that had HIV on it, then the chances are 0.3% chance that you would contract HIV. And if you had a splash exposure where blood or body fluids got into mucous membranes or in your mouth, then it would be less than 0.09% with a splash exposure. So it is very, very low chances, but we do want to take the appropriate measures when there is an exposure because you don't know. And that's why we treat all patients um, as if they have HIV and wear our gloves and things like that. There also can be perinatal transmission. So during pregnancy, there is a chance that the baby could contract HIV. Um, vaginal delivery that increases the chances greatly because it's harder to control the fluids during a vaginal delivery. A lot of times when we have a pregnant mama, we may go ahead and arrange for a C-section if we know she's HIV positive. And breastfeeding is contraindicated because the HIV virus can and will be transmitted through breast milk. To screen somebody for HIV, there's two steps. You always have to have these two steps. There's not a one single test makes the diagnosis. The first test, and the cheaper of the two, is called the ELISA, and that stands for Enzyme-Linked Immunosorbent Assay Test. This can be done on serum, or it also can be done by swabbing the inside of someone's mouth, or on spit, if you will. If we do the swab inside the patient's cheek, then that is called an aura quick test. The Western blot is the step two. We do the ELISA first. If the ELISA is positive, regardless of the route, then we do the Western blot, which is a confirmation test. We can again use serum or we can swab the inside of somebody's mouth. If we swab for the Western blot, that is called the Orisure exam. And when you have a positive ELISA and a positive Western blot, then the patient is diagnosed as being HIV positive. 
Now there are some circumstances that can give you a false positive or a false negative. If the patient has eaten recently or they're chewing gum or they have smoked, then you do want them to wait before doing either of the oral exams. You may also see that somebody will repeat an ELISA for the second time before going to the Western blot. So regardless, you have to have a positive ELISA and a positive Western blot before the diagnosis for HIV will be given. And you must have consent to test. You can't just test because you have to have permission from the patient to test them for HIV. And if you look at the consent for treatment on the hospital admission forms in very small print, it does say that we give, um, the patient gives the hospital permission to test for HIV if it is related to the current treatment plan. We can't just test somebody because we're curious. When somebody is positive for HIV, they very well may be leukopenic or have a low white blood cell count, and I've got below 5,000 there. With the CD4 T cell count, a lot of times their CD4 T cell count will be low. And remember that your T cells are the ones that are screening for things that it doesn't recognize as being itself. The virus, the HIV virus, beats up on the T cells. So, a lot of times you'll see a lower count. The normal range runs 600 to 1200. When somebody's getting below 200, they are very immunocompromised. So, they, they don't have much immune protection at all. Another test that we'll look at is somebody's viral load. And that's a serum test that tells us how much virus is in the body. And how you can relate to this is the higher the viral load, the more contagious the patient is. So the lower the viral load, the less contagious the patient is. So we want to keep our patient's T cell counts high and keep their viral loads low. So when does HIV officially become AIDS or classified as AIDS? You just have to have one of the five criteria that are listed here. If your CD4 T cell count gets below 200, well then we will classify you as having AIDS. If you develop an opportunistic infection, such as PCP, which is a pneumonia that we only see with HIV patients, or you develop tuberculosis, or you have recurring yeast infections. Those are considered opportunistic infections that only occur because your immune system is weakened. So when we see opportunistic infections develop, that means the immune system is having trouble and we can classify that person with HIV as having AIDS. Another of the criteria would be development of an opportunistic cancer. There are a couple cancers that only HIV patients will develop. So when you see those in a patient, then we know they have progressed into AIDS. The patient may develop wasting syndrome where they lose more than 10% of their body weight. Or the last criteria is if they develop AIDS dementia. We're going to look at each one of these five criteria um, over the next couple of slides. But all you have to have is one of these five and that's when we give the patient the AIDS diagnosis. It's not just HIV anymore, it's AIDS. Something to note before we get into the opportunistic infections is many, many patients who are HIV positive may never have any symptoms or may not know they have issues. Or if they have symptoms, it might present like everyday things like flu-like symptoms or maybe upper respiratory infection. So if, think about the last time you went to the doctor with an upper respiratory infection or you thought you had the flu. Did anyone ask to do an ELISA on you or test you for HIV or did they just say, oh, you've got the flu? So a lot of times we miss you know, the HIV diagnosis because it may present early on like common things that we see on a routine basis. Let's look at the opportunistic infections. 
first one being PCP or pneumocystic carnitine pneumonia. It recently was renamed to pneumocystic gyrovecchi pneumonia. Still is referred to as PCP. This is the pneumonia that we only see with HIV patients. Healthy immune system patients don't get this. They, they're protected. Signs and symptoms are just like good old pneumonia. It's interesting that 80% of patients with HIV or AIDS will have this at least once, so a very common pneumonia. We put the patients on Bactrim. And please note that we will have them on low doses of Bactrim prophylactically, so they'll take low doses of Bactrim every day to prevent PCP. And then if they do develop PCP, we'll put them on higher doses. So it's used for prophylaxis and also the treatment of PCP. It's very important that these folks get their flu shots. Of course, we want that to be the IM flu shot. You don't want them inhaling or using the flu mist, which is a live virus, since they are immunocompromised. But they would get the flu shots that are given in the arm. We also would encourage them to get their pneumonia immunizations to keep them protected. Other opportunistic infections include the mycobacterium tuberculosis or TB. Please note there are three key signs to TB, active TB, and that is night sweats, the weight loss, and the hemoptysis or coughing up blood. Any time a patient tells you that they are having night sweats, they've lost a lot of weight for no known reason, or they're coughing up blood, somebody in that room needs to wear a mask, either you or the patient, until we know different. And that's something the nurse has to initiate. Don't wait down the road for a doctor to say, oh, I think he has TB. If somebody tells you that they have any of those symptoms, probably need to wear a mask until we know different. How are we going to prevent TB? Prophylactically, we're going to check patients and do TB skin testing if we know they're HIV positive. We'll do follow-up chest x-rays. And if they do have a positive TB test, we'll put them on the INH to hopefully prevent them from developing active TB. When they do have active TB, they will be on the INH and rifampin. And please keep in mind, rifampin, that's that drug that will turn body fluids orangey-red color. So, good thing to tell the patient. Candidas can also occur. This is yeast, just ongoing, reoccurring yeast. And you might see this on skin, mouth, vagina, could be in the large intestine. So recurring yeast that just doesn't go away or doesn't stay gone, that's suggestive that there's something going on with the immune system. Prophylactically, we can treat these patients with diflucan, so they may be on diflucan every day to prevent it. And then when they do develop it, we might use higher doses of diflucan. Yogurt with live cultures is a good idea. Good oral care is imperative. And if you look in your textbook, look in your Pearson book, I do not have the correct page listed here, but if you check it out, there are going to be many, I think there's a table with the other opportunistic infections that you might see with somebody who has AIDS. I listed the three most common, but please note there are others out there. With the opportunistic cancers, Kaposi's sarcoma, I've got the pictures there for you. This is a very, very painful um, rash that develops. It starts out flat and pink, but then turns that dark violet black color. And an interesting thing with the Kaposi sarcoma is it's going to be symmetrical. So if you have it on one arm, it's going to be on the other arm. If it's on one leg, it's on the other leg. And this also occurs on the inside as well, so where we can't see. And this is very, very painful. So it's inside and outside. Again, only patients who are HIV positive can develop Kaposi sarcoma. I have heard of some rare, rare cases where this was the first thing we saw. And then the doctor decided, oh, we should test this patient for HIV. So this might have been the first major symptom that the patient had. And no long, no, not only were they HIV positive, but now we classify them as having AIDS. 
Treatment for Kaposi's sarcoma, we can use chemotherapy, sometimes local radiation depending on the size of the lesions, and cryotherapy, so where we freeze the lesions as well, but very painful. With the HIV wasting syndrome, this is where we have an involuntary weight loss. A lot of times it's related to other factors. If they have a lot of yeast, well then they're going to have some GI issues. The medicines that we'll talk about soon, they cause a lot of GI issues as well. Um, they may not be strong enough to feed their self or get good nutrition. So there's several different reasons that we may see the HIV wasting syndrome. Um, over 90% of people with HIV or AIDS, uh, we do see the wasting syndrome. You generally don't see folks who are normal weight or overweight with HIV. So to treat these patients, we want to increase their protein, increase their calories. We can give them human growth hormone, which will help build bulk, body bulk. Um, we also, so there are some states you can use medical marijuana that will stimulate appetite or megase, uh, which is a appetite stimulant as well that a lot of times we use for older patients to stimulate their appetite. There's also Marinol, I don't have that on the slide, but Marinol is like a synthetic marijuana to increase your appetite. So there's several different things that we can do to facilitate that. With AIDS dementia, the HIV infective cells are going to eventually die. And when there's cell death, it's going to cause toxins to be released. These toxins can cross the blood-brain barrier and cause altered mental status. And the patients are going to, it's essentially going to be just like any other dementia. The treatment for these patients, we'll use Haldol and Ativan. And then, of course, anytime you have somebody with an altered mental status, the first thing you need to think about is safety, for sure. Nursing interventions. We're going to monitor our respiratory function, especially we know there's a huge risk for PCP. Avoid known infections. Strict asepsis, so make sure you're washing your hands. Allow the patients to rest. They're going to need time to rest. Elevate the head of the bed. That's going to help facilitate respiratory effort. Get a nutritionist in the room there to see what the patient's interests are as far as meals, what they can tolerate, what they're interested in. Not only do we have to encourage high-protein, high-calorie meals, but we want to make sure we're providing foods that the patient's interested in. Small frequent feedings are probably going to be best. If you have, eat more, it's going to cause GI upset. We will monitor daily weights. We're going to avoid fatty foods just because they probably are already going to have GI upset. If they have a lot of loose stools or diarrhea, that's going to cause us to need to do skin precautions um, on the bottom. Um, if they have wounds or Kaposi sarcoma, you may be doing wound care as well. Want to make sure they're staying oriented and they're safe, especially if you have signs of the AIDS dementia. Provide emotional support. Now these folks are going to be immunocompromised, but you're never ever going to 100% cut off all their contacts. So we may limit visitors, but we're not going to totally restrict their visitors. They need to have emotional support. And on that note, just a little side note there, just because the patient is hospitalized and being treated um, for AIDS or HIV even, don't assume everybody in the room that's visiting know that. So you need to be really careful about who's present in the room and what you say. And even if you're going in to take your patient their medicines, be careful because, again, not everybody in that room may know 100% about what's going on with the patient. Okay. To meet the patient's nutritional needs, IV fluids may be warranted or even TPN. We need to pre prevent opportunistic infections, so a lot of those prophylactic medicines like the Bactrim and the INH may come into play, and then manage any pain that the patient may have. Imagine the social issues that are going to go along with the HIV or AIDS diagnosis. 
Um, there are plans in place, federal plans in place to help patients get their medication. Um, there are also plans in place to help folks with long-term care if needed. So there are resources out there. There locally we have the Unity Wellness Center of East Alabama which basically pr provide everything a patient would need um, living with HIV. They can even go as far as help with housing and transportation to doctor's appointments and things like that. So um, yes there is a huge social stigma but there are resources out there to help patients who are living with HIV or AIDS. There is something called a syringe exchange program where uh, chronic IV drug users can take their used dirty needles and exchange them for clean needles. That is very controversial and that might be why we only see it in 38 of 50 states. Our closest um, syringe exchange program is in Atlanta and there's actually only one in Georgia, it is in Atlanta, but somebody who is a chronic drug user, IV drug user, can bring in dirty needles, swap, swap them out for clean ones, but while they're there they also get education, they can get HIV testing, they can get condoms, they can get several different resources all in this one location, so there has been some success with that in some places. I put vaccinations on here with a question mark, the reason being with the virus continuing to mutate, it's that's why we don't have a vaccination against it. That's why we don't have an immunization. Will we see one? I hope so. I hope so. Very important that we know what the patient knows about HIV. Um, what do they know about AIDS? What's their education level? So we need to inform people. Um, about what this is and how it's transmitted. There's a lot of mistruths out there too, I think. So just making sure patients have the facts. Then we have to consider the emotional, what's going on with the patient emotionally. It, it would be life-changing um, on so many different levels to have the diagnosis of HIV. But something to keep in mind from a nursing perspective, these patients that have this, they didn't sign up for it. They didn't ask for it. There may have been some um, poor choices. We have all made poor choices, but we just need to keep that in mind um, and provide that emotional support for them because it's, it's a challenging time. The HIV and pregnancy, we do screen pregnant mamas in some states. Not all states are required to screen pregnant mamas, but in some states they are screened. Uh, Georgia does require it, Alabama does not. So when a mom comes in and you know finds out she's pregnant, they go ahead and automatically test for HIV in certain states. If we can find out and mama, a pregnant mama, is HIV positive, we can do things to prevent the baby from getting HIV. So by the mama taking antivirals or HIV medications during pregnancy, we can decrease the chance from 25% to less than 2% that her baby will have HIV. It's so important that we encourage these moms to get tested. And some don't, they don't want to know if they are HIV positive. We have to remember that. But it's so important that we encourage everyone to get tested when they're pregnant because we can take, we can intervene, therefore decrease the chances of their baby having HIV if they know. With our pediatric patients, the progression to AIDS is usually faster. So if we see a pediatric patient that has HIV, that course of how long does it take, it, it's generally going to be faster. Signs and symptoms are going to be related to the baby being failure to thrive, lymph enlargement, you're going to see recurring yeast infections or thrush. Digital clubbing occurs due to the pneumonia and you'll see early opportunistic infections as well. So just, just a baby that is sickly does not do well. Something to keep in mind is that ELISA or the Western blot may not be accurate for children under 18 months and the reason is babies are going to have the presence of their mom's antibodies and that's important to note when we do the ELISA and the Western blot we are not
testing for the virus, we're looking for antibodies. You have antibodies in your serum, you have antibodies in your spit or your saliva. So we are looking for those antibodies. We're not looking for the virus. And ELISA and Western blot will not be accurate for children under 18 months because mama's antibodies are still going to be there and give us a false positive. Now there are some more um, sophisticated tests that can be run but we may not know for certain right away whether or not the baby is positive or not. We will start infants, children on prophylactic Bactrim and antiviral therapy but also please note mom can refuse treatment for the baby.